sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of the beauty sing. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and duty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words. Wonderful words. Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of love. Press the blessed one keys to all, wonderful words of life. Sing the list of the love. Wonderful words of learning, all so freely given, pulling us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Wonderful words of love, offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of love, Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful. Shall we kneel down for a prayer? Father, we come before you this evening thanking you for your love and your kindness, for your mercies that are new every morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be among us, to soften our hearts and prepare the soil of our hearts to receive the message you have for us this evening. We acknowledge that we are sinful, but we have learned of your faithfulness to forgive. And we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, that you might cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that the wall of sin that has been built will be torn down, and that we might be ready to receive you and to be transformed for eternal life. May your Holy Spirit be upon our speaker, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, may you put your words in his mouth, for it is only your words that can save us. May you speak to us. We know that the evil one is not happy when your word is being shared. We ask that may you paralyze the forces of darkness in Jesus' name. We know that you are more powerful. May you restrain the devil as you seek to save us with your word is our humble asking. In Jesus' name, may we never be the same again. Amen. Family in Christ, uh, thank you to all those who've joined. Um, without wasting much time, I'll just introduce the officers serving you today. My name is Sister Florence Cicione, and the man who God has chosen to break the bread uh, for the next two weeks is none other than Pastor Randy Skeet. I will now give him this time. God bless you, Pastor.
Oh Lord, my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. The waters stood above the mountains, at thy rebuke they fled, at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away, they go down by the valley unto the place which thou hast founded for them. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle, and herb for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth, and wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. are full of sap, where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, the fir trees are her house. Thou makest darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will be glad in the Lord. God is good. And all the time, Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. Come on, say amen. When God blesses us, he's good. Hmm? When he punishes us, tell me, he's good. When he answers your prayer, come on, he's good. When he says a resounding thunderous no, he's good. God is always good. He cannot be anything else. And so Psalm 145 verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So when you and I are angry with God, we are angry with righteousness and holiness. Because the Bible says the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. To be angry with God is to be angry with righteousness and holiness. That can only happen when someone suffers from temporary insanity. I'm happy to see you. Well, somebody say, it's nice to see me. Hi, this begging I have to do every night. How are you doing? How was your day? Did you pray? How many times? You're talking so softly, I cannot hear you. How many times did you pray? Twice. How many times did you pray on this side? Once. Okay. God is missing you. <laughs> How many times did you pray on this side? You didn't pray. <laughs> ah, Father. <laughs> the Bible says, pray how often? Don't pause. Don't pause. The Bible says, pray how often? Without ceasing. Is that in Revelation? No, it's not symbolic. <laughs> It's literal. Some night I'll tell you how to do that. Pray without ceasing. It's good to see you. God bless you. Have you been thanking God for life? The fact that you can walk? There's a roof over your house? You had some rice today? And you plan to have some tonight? We thank God for everything. Really. God gave you a good mind, so you're pursuing a degree. Hmm? Your children are in the church. You thank God. You have a car that doesn't break down. It has four wheels, not two and a half. You thank God for what? Everything. In everything, tell me, give thanks. For this is the will of God. It's the will of God. It's sometimes a difficult text to apply to one's life. 
Your child is dead in the hospital and you're supposed to give thanks. When God makes a command or requirement, there are no exceptions. When Job lost his entire family in one day, all 10 children, all his business assets, he gave thanks to God. Because the mindset of a child of God is vastly different from the mindset of an earthling. Let me leave that alone. Who's with us tonight? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are here for the first time. Stand. Up. Ah. Stay standing. Stay standing. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are here for the first time. Stand. All right, we have little gifts for you, please. Where are the gift givers? And then I want to offer a special prayer for you. So please remain standing. For those of you online, I cannot see you with my physical eye. I have to see you with the eye of faith. The prayer will also include you. Oh, you know, here's a sister in the back. I just, okay, make sure she gets her little gift. Please read it. You will not regret it. All right. Uh, all our friends have that gift in their hands. My, oh, you do? Okay, all right. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, standing before you are guests of this Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are always honored by the presence of visitors. Now I ask you, dear God, look upon them with favor. Remind them of your immeasurable love for them and bless them. Father, you know what's the greatest need. You know what is best for them. Give it to them, Father. But don't give it to them sparingly. Bless them bountifully, dear God, in every area of their lives. And hasten the day when they will be one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Let God's people say amen and amen. Thank you for coming and may God bless you. Let me shake your hand since you're so close. You will represent everyone. But it's not in the Bible. But it's a good name. Cecilia, I shook everyone's hand by shaking yours. How are you? Yes. Hmm? Oh, sister, God bless you. And I hope you and I live on the same street in heaven. I am fine. I am just fine. Thanks for asking. I like you. I love you for that. All right, I have a quiz for you to, to, to prepare you for the word of God. You all look bright. Say amen. <laughs> okay. Let it come up. This thing was turned off. <clears throat> I wish I could see the online audience, but I cannot. Wherever you are, God bless you. What camera should I look into? I should have found that out before. What camera should I look into to look to talk to the people online? Which one? Where is it? Oh, that one right there. Thank you for joining us online. God bless you. God bless you. We're happy you're with us. I want to assure you that the Spirit of God will work to connect you and us as one as we worship God in spirit and in truth. God bless you wherever you are. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Say amen. Why did I have to ask you to say amen? You need to be severely caned. All right. And I can do that. Okay, are you ready for the quiz? For once, can you change your culture and answer me? You won't go to hell, I promise you. Answer me. Are you ready for the quiz? Ah, now you sound as though you're alive. You look as though you're sleeping with your eyes open. All right. Name Abraham's sons. Hmm? And? Very good. Keep going. That's right. Hmm? Help them out this side. Name Abraham's sons. Ishmael and Isaac, very good, but keep going. <laughs> Go to Genesis chapter 25. I'm glad I'm giving you this quiz. I am glad. Genesis 25. Okay, stop all this mumbling. Just go to Genesis 25. Do you have it? Let's read from verse 1. Now, since you failed question 1, you at least can 
give me the favor of reading with me. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran and Jokshan and Medad and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Now, how many sons did Abraham have? Come on, didn't you take math? You told me Isaac and Ishmael, am I right? Now, how many did we have? Zimran and Jokshan and Medad and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. How many sons did Abraham have? Eight. I'm not mad. I'm just trying to bring you alive. <laughs> Eight boys. Now, let me talk about that quickly. What time is it? Is that a quarter to seven? This tells us about the goodness of God. When Abraham was 100, he could not have a son. He was reproductively dead. When God put life in his loins, he not only came up with Ish Isaac, he came up with six more boys. Because when God blesses you, he blesses you. Can you say amen? So it's essential to understand that Abraham had more than Ishmael and Isaac. He had Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Now, tomorrow night, I'll ask you to recite those six boys. All six names. Strange, but learn them. All right. Number two. Name Adam's first three sons. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not the Tower of Babel. Wait a minute. <laughs> this side, Adam's first three boys. This side, too slow. That side. Cain and who? And Seth. Very, that side, are they right? Yes. When you said yes, you were guessing. <laughs> Question number three. Who in the Bible had 72 sons? He was not a Namibian, don't worry. Who in the Bible had 72 sons? Online, you can join in, we'll hear you by faith. 72 sons, and one son killed 70. Gideon, ah, we have some scholars to the left. All right, number four. Who said, let there be light? Jesus, ah, Jesus, ah. Jesus, don't say God, you're right, but I want a name. It was Jesus, your Savior, who became man, but never stopped being God. Number four, on which day were fish created? Fourth day, this, are they right? No, they're wrong. <laughs> on which day were fish created? Come on, huh? Day five. Yes, pastor. But pastor, don't show off. Let others give the question. <laughs> it is day five. All right. Next question. What was Eve's surname? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on. I am coming from the Bible. What was Eve's surname? It was Adam. Yes. Her name was Eve Adam. Eve took her husband's name. Despite modern practices, go to Genesis 5. We need to see that with our own eyes. Genesis 5. All the men are happy. <laughs> my wife must have my name. Do you have Genesis 5? Read from verse 1. What does it say? This is the book of the... Generation of Adam in the day that made, in the likeness of God made he, male and female created he them and called their name Adam. Both were called Adam, but only Eve was called Eve. So Adam had one name, Adam, but Eve was Eve Adam. Come on, say amen. <laughs> All right, let's get off that before we have civil war. Next question, who was the last king of Judah? I knew you'd go silent. <laughs> the last king of Judah. Before Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem in 597 or 87, whenever it was. Last king of Judah. You're close. You're close. Zedekiah, who was connected to Jehoiakim, yes. Je Jehoiachin was removed, and Nebuchadnezzar put Zedekiah in on the throne. 
How many children did Jacob have? 13. He had one girl called Dinah. Now, how many boys did he have? Get ready for this. Take a deep breath. Name them in order. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Here's a hand. Please stand, my lovely sister. Please stand. Name them in order. Here we go. Very nice. Say amen for the child of God. Yes. All right. <laughs> That's the only time I've ever met someone who could do that. Mm-hmm. The 12 tribes of Israel in order. How old was Ellen White when she received her first vision? 17. God bless you. Very good. Which means that God called the youth to be one of the founding members of this church. James White was about 19. J.N. Andrews was about 15. Last question. Who was the first SDA missionary sent overseas? J.N. Andrews, yes, J.N. Andrews. It was said that he could read the Bible or the New Testament in six different languages and had memorized the entire New Testament. God bless you for trying. I hope you are feeling urged to go read the Bible again. And when you read, read closely. The Bible is so fascinating. Read closely. All right. Our message for this evening, servants of the Most High. What did I say? Before we get into the message, I just turned it on, but I double-checked. It's off. Please, if you're not using one, if you're not, make sure it's turned off. Remember what I said about screens. Who brought Bibles? Raise your Bibles. Let me see them. Raise them, raise them, raise them. All right. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. We're getting somewhere. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. As I frequently say, then the Lord, that's divine, put forth his hand, that's divine, and touched my mouth, that's human. And the Lord divine said to me, human, behold, I divine have put my words divine. In thy mouth, human. What do we have? A cooperation between human and divine. Or let me reverse the order between divine and human. God wants that with us individually. As a matter of fact, without that cooperation, salvation cannot take place. The most popular verse in the Bible says, For God, that's Him, God, so loved the world, that's us, that He gave, that's God. He loved, He gave, that whosoever believeth. That's us. In the work of redemption, God requires the cooperation of man. No one can be saved against his or her wishes. What's the other side of that coin? No one can be lost without his or her choice. God cannot make you obey. The devil cannot make you sin. The decision is in your hands. Remember that as you listen to the message, and when I make the appeal, the decision is in your hands. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now. Let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as I make my human effort to deliver divine truth, it is clear to God, I need divine help. You've put this treasure in earthen vessels, and I am as earthen as they come. Fill me with your spirit, not for my sake, dear God, but for your glory. If I've offended you, forgive me. You're not a God to hold grudges. My desire, my purpose in this desk is to lift up truth, for in lifting up truth, I lift you up. Bless those listening. Give me simple language that they may understand, thus saith the Lord. Bless those online, touch them, dear God, in a very personal way. Bless every country represented by those listening. Bless the leaders of those countries, but particularly the host country of Namibia. 
grant to all these leaders the constant awareness that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. Remind them, the God, when they become too comfortable, that God said he removeth kings and setteth up kings. So in all that they do, let them remember to make choices that will not impede the advancement of your gospel. Bless the sick, good God. Touch them right now, Father. Bring relief. Remove COVID-19. Bring back those children who have left the truth. Bring back family members who've drifted, Father. Ease suffering. Heal broken homes, Father. And deliver young people from the grasp of the enemy. Now, God, take all the glory. I mean that, Father. But give us the blessings because we need them. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? Quickly. I did say quickly. Let's go to Genesis 1. Am I too hard on you sometimes? Yes, as somebody said, yes. Well, I'll try to be nice. So if you pray, I'll be nice. What book did I say? What chapter? What verse? I didn't say. Verse 14. Checking to see if you're listening. Verse 14. You have that? And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Stop. We will reread that passage. We're looking for two, two, two. Are you with me? We're looking for function. All right. Let's start again. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. Now you read. Two divide the day from the night. Keep going. Let them be four, that's a two, signs and seasons, and four, days and years, that's another two. Even though it's not written, it's understood. To divide the day from the night, to be for signs and seasons, you know, for days and years, and to give light on the face of the earth. They were made to do this, to do that, to do that, and to do that. What do you call those things? I told you earlier. Functions. But functions assigned by whom? Jesus Christ, the creator. Which means that when God creates something, read my mind and tell me what I'm about to say. It has a function. Or someone. Let's go to uh, verse 20 of Genesis 1. Our subject Servants of the Most High. Verse 20 of Genesis 1. Are you there? You may read with me. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. What were the birds supposed to do? They yeah, inhabit the, 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 the firmament. Fly above our heads. Nest in the trees. Above. Hmm? Let's go to verse 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Now God made vegetation, he made grass. Now go to verse 29. And God said, behold, I've given you what? Every herb bearing seed and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. Finish that verse. To you, come on, it shall be for me. What was the function of vegetation? Food. It had a function. The birds occupy the firmament. Clearly then we can conclude the fish do what? Occupy, populate the seas. Anything created by God finish my words, as a function. All right. So when you read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, all things in the heaven, and everything on earth created by God has a function. Let's strengthen that point by going to Psalm 119. 
Our subject, servants of the Most High. It's like 7 o'clock. I'll release you by 7.30. It doesn't take God long to bless his people. What book did I say? What chapter? The longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. Beautiful chapter. It is very stylistically arranged. It is actually 28 stanzas, each one of eight verses, or uh, yes, eight, eight lines of verses, eight, 22 divisions, eight stanzas for each division. And each division is named after a letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So from verse one to eight would be Aleph. From verse nine to 70 would be Bet. All the letters of the alphabet, each one is assigned to one of the 22 divisions. Are you with me? All right, we're going to the beginning of one of the divisions. <clears throat> Verse 89 of Psalm 119. What's our subject? Servants of the Most High. Forever, O Lord, thy word is what? Settled where? In heaven. By the way, what can you also conclude? Tell me Genesis 1.1. Now, what's the third favor I always ask you? The reason. All right. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled where? But what must you also conclude? And on earth. Mm -hmm. Let's go to verse 90. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth, or it remains. They continue this day according to thy ordinances. Finish that verse. For all are thy servants. Now stop. Think, think. What do you understand by all are thy servants? What do you understand by they continue this day in verse 91? Who is they? What did we meet in verse 89? Heaven. What do we meet in verse 90? Who is they? Heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth. They continue this day. The heaven and the earth remain. Why? By the ordinances of God. The commands of God. You know, God says in the book of Job somewhere, of the seas thus far and no further. That's an ordinance the sea obeys. You have a coastline in Namibia, hundreds of miles, the skeleton coast, they call it, all those seals. The water comes in, finish my words, goes back. God has put an ordinance on the sea, in, out, in, out. And no human being can change that. So verse 91 of Psalm 119 says, they continue this day. In other words, from the time they were made until the writing of that psalm, they've continued. According to thy ordinance. Now, finish the verse. And all are thy servants. Now, everything in the heavens serves God. You and I need not understand in microscopic detail how that happens. Everything in the heaven serves God. Do the birds serve God? Did not God command birds to feed Elijah? Give me a yes or no. They served him. What does the Bible say? If I command a locust to devour the land, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 13, do the locusts obey God? Yes. When Jesus said, peace be still, and the waves kept quiet, do the waves obey God? Yes. Animate and inanimate. Serve God. When you read, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, you need to understand creation in its entirety came into existence for the service of God. That's why the Bible says, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. That's the entire heavens. Psalms, uh, Isaiah 6 verse 3, the whole earth is full of his glory. 
put heavens together, earth together, wherever you turn. Creation somehow advertises the glory of God. But let's reflect on creation a little deeper, but let me pray first. Father, be with me, God, as I deal with this most important subject. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Go to Genesis 1. Let's read verse 3. Genesis 1 verse 3, we're reading the first four verses, or first three verses of Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Are you there? What are the first three words? Mm -hmm. Verse 6. Verse 9. Verse 11. Verse 14. Verse 20. Verse 24. Verse 26, yes, mm -hmm. and God said, then we have, let there be light, let there be a firmament, let the waters of the heavens, let the earth bring forth grass, let there be lights in the firmament, let the waters bring forth abundantly, let the earth bring forth the living creature. Now, look at verse 26. Read it for me. And God said what? Let us make man, come on, in our, now, in our image. Where do we encounter the image of God? In the creation, come on, talk to me, of mankind. But we read or we heard in Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Mm. You look up at night and you're honest, some powerful being did that. You need not know the name. The Bible says in Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is the Bible telling us? The evidence of the presence of a mighty being is so strong, no one has an excuse. But as much as creation reflects the glory of God, the trees were not made in God's image. Not a mountain, not a fish, not a bird, not a grass. Only human beings. Now, we established earlier, all of creation, every aspect of creation has what? Function. Now, if the part of creation not made in the image of God has a function, hmm? are you with me? Can you imagine how it is for those made in the image of God? Come on. If any part of creation has a function, it is human beings. Because the Bible is clear. Let us make man how? In, that's, you, that's the function God has given to you and me. Reflect me. Not reflect you and me. reflect me case closed i've observed sometimes i wonder how do people get into the problems they get into i mean christians not the worldlings how did she get into that mess how did he get into that mess I suggest a violation of Genesis 126. And God said, let us make man in our image, which means your function, your job description is my glory, not mine and yours, just mine. Let me put it more bluntly. When God made Adam, Adam had no image of his own. Adam only got an image after sin. Are you with me? Before sin, Adam's image was God's image. If Adam had never sinned, in whose image would Cain have been born? 
not Adam, God's. If anyone is not following me, raise your hand. I'll go over it again. You're with me. If Adam had not sinned, my friends online, I hope you're with me, Cain would have been born in the image of God, mediated through Adam. Abel would have been born in the image of God. Now, of Cain and Abel, which one was righteous? Come on, tell me. But with whose image was he born? Adam's image. Mm -hmm. Not God's. You have, and I have, by God's arrangement, no image of our own, even though God made us with different personalities, but every personality has a major function, what? The glory of God. Now, a lot of young people listening to me, you're going to school to study one esoteric subject or another. Why? Why are you studying agronomy? Why are you studying social science? Why are you studying actuarial science? Why are you studying astrophysics? Is it for the glory of God? That has to be the reason. Now, I said earlier, sometimes I am mystified by the problems people get themselves into, and I have gotten myself into, but don't tell anyone. Because we do not put God, tell me the word, first. I was talking to her. She's probably listening to me right now. <laughs> lovely, lovely daughter of God who wants to get married. She lives somewhere on the earth. And I wrote back and said, who told you to get married? And she said, it's amazing to be married. I said, yeah. I'm just trying to get her to think, why do you want to be married. What's in it for God? Now, this is extreme. And you're looking at me and the expression on your faces tell me this man is an extremist. On this point, yes. If God is the motivating factor for everything we do, our problems would drop precipitously. Because when you do it for God's glory, God takes charge of it. Ah, you didn't hear me. When you do it for God's glory, God takes charge of it now. The three Hebrew boys in Daniel 3, they were top of the class. But who was their focus at all times? God. Now, before you panic and you say, well, should I go study theology? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying, Commit your course of study to God's glory. Apologize to God for choosing an area of study without considering his glory. Not every good thing God wants you to do. Did not David want to build the ark, uh, not the ark, the temple? Yes or no? Wasn't that a nice thing? Yes. God said, not you. Solomon. You may want to be the prime minister of Namibia, or is it president? Which is it? Both? Which is it? Okay. <laughs> the head of state of Namibia. God may say, no, not you. I want you to be a cult porter. But a cult porter has no prestige. Are you following me? Nobody bows to cult porter. Nobody steps aside when he or she comes by. They do that for the big shots. So very often, we make choices based on what will that do for me? What will that do for my standing in society? How will people look at, not how will it, what will it do for God? And I'm not speaking symbolically. And so my friend, I said, upon what authority have you chosen to be married? And she said, maybe I need to think. I said, not maybe you need to think. You absolutely need to think. And I reassured her, I am not telling you do not get married. I'm asking you why. And for the Christian, the why must always be, you tell me, the glory of God. 
And there are no exceptions to that rule. Because you and I were put on this earth for God's glory, not for ours. But what we fail to understand, when God's glory comes our business, God lifts us to heights we could never have lifted ourselves. Go to Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. We'll read verse 7. 7, 15 by that clock on the wall. Do you have Isaiah 43? I'll try my luck. Well, not luck, but uh, you know what I mean. And I'll ask you to read for me. Hmm. Are you at Isaiah 43? Come on, nice and loud. What does that say? First line, for I have Isaiah 43, 7. Even everyone that is called by my name, yes, for I have created him. Come on. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's why God made humanity. I have created him for my glory. My young friends, I'm talking to everyone, but since this is a youth crusade, particularly my young friends online and in person, you are on this earth for God's business. When you make choices, make choices with God in mind. First, I was conducting a campaign in a certain country on the face of the earth. And this young couple came for counseling. And I, we prayed, and the local pastor was with me because they spoke a language I didn't speak. I said, well, nice to see you. What's the problem? We want a child. I said, fine. God invented childbearing and child rearing too. Don't just bear them and leave them. Rear them. Are you with me? That's another story. I said, well, tell me about yourselves. We are jobless. This is the truth. We have lots of debt. We're uneducated. They had told me that first, as a matter of fact, before expressing the desire for offspring. I said, tell me again what you want. We want a child. Now describe your condition again. We're jobless. We have a lot of debt. And we're on a day. That's what they told me. And I said, you want to bring a child into this environment? No, I can't tell you. It's too personal. Yea or nay. I'm simply saying, you're bringing, you're suffering. Your husband is suffering. You need company in the suffering. So let's bring a child into that environment. So three of us can suffer together. Now, I told you it's a very serious and personal issue. I'm saying that to say this. We make choices in every area of life based on what we want, not the glory of God. And we end up in trouble. Listen to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Go to John 8. John 8. What's our subject? Servants of the Most High. Am I being too hard on you? All right. I feel comforted by your no. Thank you very much. Do you have John chapter 8? Let me pray before I give you the verse. Father, as I continue, help me to speak with compassion, for I too am a sinner. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to Christ. Verse 29 of John 8. Are you there? And he that hath sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. Finish the verse. For I do what? Always those things. Come on. That please him. Now we wonder how Christ could perform the miracles he performed. That's the secret. Mm -hmm, thank you. The secret of the powerful life of Christ is not that he was also God. 
It is in his humanity, he put the father first in everything he did. The Desire of Ages, page 664. What did I say? Let me try it again. The Desire of Ages, page 664, paragraph 4. What did I say? Jesus revealed no qualities and exercised no powers that men may not have through faith in him. His perfect humanity is that which all his followers may possess if they will be in subjection to God as he was. When the flood came, how many were saved? How many righteous people left Sodom and Gomorrah? The two daughters of Lot are not described as righteous. You know, you're not righteous and sleep with your father. Lot is described as righteous. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about how the numbers God has on his side? Always little. But despite being little, there's room for you in that group. God wants a people who will put him first in everything. God wants young people who will consider his glory in every decision they make, whether educational, romantic, economic, social, recreational, you name it. God needs an army of young men and young women who will consider him first, like Joseph who said, how can I do what? This great wickedness and sin against that man. That's what he said. Come on, correct me quickly. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, Joseph was putting promotion in jeopardy. Some people sleep their way to the top. And in that, by doing that, they spiritually sleep their way down. Joseph could have had on his side an advocate, Sister Potiphar. But Joseph had God as an advocate. Can you say amen? And even though he went to prison because he was right, God was just preparing him for a position higher than anything Sister Potiphar could have given him. Because when God elevated Joseph, he elevated Joseph above Potiphar. You didn't hear what I said. Probably my fault. When Abraham and Lot could not get along because their possessions were so great. Abraham said, let's separate. Abraham was older. He was the uncle. Lot was the nephew. But Abraham, for the sake of the glory of God and not wanting to give the surrounding tribes the wrong impression of God's people, he told Lot, choose first. Hmm? Sometimes to glorify God, you must surrender a right to protect a principle. And so Lot chose all the grassy land. When you have cattle, you want land, you want water, you want grass. Lot chose all of that. Left Abraham with the rocky, hilly area, but God's glory was intact. So God said to Abraham, lift up now thine eyes from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and eastward, for all the land which thou seest. To thee, not to Lot, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. When God said that, he included the land that Lot had chosen. Are you following me? Listen to me. Faithfulness to God may seem not to be rewarding immediately. It may seem because God is testing what? Your faith. But if you're persistent in your faithfulness to God, God would lift you where you could never have lifted yourself. You will go through life and look back and you'll see how God has spared you from a thousand catastrophes. Why? Because by giving your life to him, every area of your life, your life became his life. And he ran your life as a divine uh, CEO. Servants of the Most High. If creation serves God, hmm, how much those made 
in God's image. You are on the earth for the glory of God. Your man was a little weak, but uh, it's better than nothing. Let me give you another verse that is not symbolic. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. Let's read verse 19. It is not symbolic. Most of the Bible is literal. Take it as it reads, unless it is obviously and inescapably symbolic. You have 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. Talking to the members of the church. Mm -hmm. Listen to what's the first word in that verse? What? You know, Paul is saying, I don't believe that you don't understand this. What? Know ye not that you're what? Body is, come on. Temple of the? Stop. If your body and mine are the temples of the Holy Ghost, in what condition should we keep that body? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the last line of verse 19? Ye are not? Stop. Is that literal or symbolic? It's, listen to me. You and I do not belong to ourselves. First line of verse 20. For you bought with a price. Therefore, keep reading, glorify God, come on, in your body and in your, which are God's. You're hearing me, but you're not getting it. How many of you can see me? Can I see how you can see me? Your eyes, okay, your vision, finish my words. Come on, your vision belongs to God. Why are you watching pornography with eyes that you, you're taking God's eyes to watch pornography? They're not your eyes. You're taking God's stomach and fill it with alcohol. If I loaned you my car, would you paint it a different color? Pinstripe? <laughs> or polka dot? Because you prefer that? It's my car. You treat it better than you treat your car. Because you have to give an account to me. With the same degree of literalness, your mind, finish my words, belongs to God. What are you putting in it? Romance novels? Then you can't understand ABC. You don't know where Genesis is? I'm tired. But thank God to be alive. I want you right where you are to do two things. Apologize to God for acting as if you belong to you. Then apologize to God for not putting him first. And those apologies must not be symbolic. And I'm, I'm referring to every age group in this building and online. Apologize to God for taking God's possessions and acting as if you are the, the rightful owner. You are not. Your mouth belongs to God. What words emerge? Your hands, your feet, ye are not your own. You were made to be a servant of the Most High, as verily as physical nature. But only you and I, through Adam, were made in the image of God. And no person who promotes self can reflect the image of God. You may have two PhDs. You may be the minister of, or the prime minister of four different countries at the same time. If God is not the reason why you do what you do, you will not reflect the image of God. And he or she who does not reflect God's image reflects, you tell me, Satan's image. But Satan's image is sometimes in a tuxedo. Mm -hmm. The men who said, crucify him, they weren't forming at the mouth. Are you following me? They were dressed in high priestly robes. 
They were sitting in the seat of the high priest. Most demon-possessed people look normal. Don't look around. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Most demon-possessed people look normal. That's why they're so effective. In the devil's hands. Spirit-possessed people. That's what we ought to be. The same way a demon possesses a person. Takes the person's mouth and speaks. Are you following me? Takes the person's arms and makes it strong. God's Holy Spirit wants to possess us. Take our mouth and speak through us. Take our eyes and look through us. Take our bodies and work through us. Somebody say amen for Holy Spirit possession. Because you and I are servants, come on, tell me, of the Most High. And that is not symbolic. Let me smile. <laughs> I was preaching somewhere. The little boy said to his father, why is the preacher angry? <laughs> I said, I almost died laughing. No, the preacher isn't angry. The preacher is passionate. Do you understand I want you in the kingdom of God? I, uh, I'm finishing in a minute. Well, it's 7.30. Okay, give me 10 minutes. Say yes. <laughs> you can't wait for people to say yes sometimes. Tell them what to say. Or they'll say no. I pray for people sometimes that I don't know. Because I like God to save them. Being lost. Uh, people love to hear God is love, and he is. But they forget that the most popular verse has love and it has hell. Let me identify hell. For God so loved the world, and we love that. Oh, God is a nice person. That he gave his only begotten son. We like that. That whosoever believeth, okay, should not. What's that? Hell. But have everlasting life. What's that? Heaven. The most popular verse has heaven. And hell, people only want to hear about heaven. <laughs> the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a terrible thing when God grabs you in anger and his anger is righteous. I want you in God's kingdom. I want you to trust God. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, he took them into a desert. You don't go into a desert looking for a lot of food, a lot of water. You don't go there. But he took them into an environment that they might learn that all that they need, God can provide. Miraculously. And so he rained bread from heaven 40 uninterrupted years. And only six days a week. Each week. Never on the seventh day. It stopped when they crossed Jordan. 40 years later, they crossed into Canaan. The fields were already planted. The houses were there. The Bible says, I'm giving you crops that you did not plant, vineyards you did not plant, houses you did not build. They walked into a land already ready for them. And the manna stopped miraculously. Every day. You know, it's hot in the desert. The Manami Desert is just down the street. God sent a cloud to keep off those rays. Every day is freezing cold in the desert because the heat just escapes. There's no cloud cover to hold the heat. It escapes freezing and drop below. God sent a, filler, a pillar of fire every single night. He did the impossible for his people. You don't go to desert looking for water. He brought water out of a rock. Every day it flowed. What is God's message to us? I can take care of you. But I brought you out, Exodus 19, 4, 5 and 6. If you will obey my voice indeed, do what I say. How often? All the time. Then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. God called the Israelites that through them he might show the other nations the kind of God he is. Because God wants to save everyone, not just the Israelites. The Israelites were called to be servants, come on, of the Most High. Will you allow a tree to be more faithful to God than you? 
Is that what you're telling me? Or a cow? A cloud? A star? Which one of them was made in God's image? Not one. You have been called by God to the highest privilege God can bestow, that is, to represent me. Let me choose another word, to look like me. People have plastic surgery to look like Beyonce. Or they want to look like whomever, whoever you have in Namibia. I want to look like this person. I want to look like that person. God said, look, I'll tell you how you can look like me. How many of you will say, Father, forgive me for not having put you first. My eyes have been opened. Help me to make a change in my life. Can I see your right hand? Uh, God bless you. Stand up with me. Let me say this clearly. I'm not telling you to leave your bachelor's degree program in mathematics and go do gardening. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying, change the reason why you're doing it. And do it, come on, tell me, for God's glory. You want to get into a romantic relationship? Nothing wrong with that. God put the first man and the first woman together. But do it, come on, for God's Not because your tribe requires it. When you stand before the judgment, your tribe will not be with you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you, dear God, for the challenge of your word. We thank you how the word of truth, like a sword, it cuts. But it cuts to perform a life-saving operation. Father, I and this congregation repent for the many times we have put ourselves first in making decisions. We want the heavenly mindset, which is God first, God first, God first. Because the man or the woman who puts God first will be raised by God to heights that person could not otherwise have imagined. Please, Father, let your glory be our priority. Let our lives be a stage on which you demonstrate to the world your goodness, your mercy, your love, and your justice. Now, God, take tight possession of every life in this building and online. And you guide, you direct, but let them know you will guide and direct, not through miraculous expressions in the sky, but through thus saith the Lord, which they must study. Put a double blessing on all the children. And again, Father, a sweet blessing on all our guests. Heal the sick. Bless every country, Father. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, amen and amen. God is good and all the time. God bless you.